My phone says it is 6 o'clock a.m. I'm a.m. I tell you, I'm loopier than usual these days. 6 o'clock p.m. on uh, September 24th, 2020, and I will call the, the meeting of planning and zoning to order. Will you please call the roll? Absolutely, Madam Chair. Debbie Moore? Present. Glenn Johnson? Present. Cheryl Lee? Present, and I don't know if it's just me, but it's it sounds real muffled. Um, is that the same for you guys? You sound no. Good. I'm not here. Sounds good. Okay. Sounds good here. Glenn Johnson. I'm still here. And Ishmael Harris. Here. Pablo Serna. Here. Cynthia? It is sounding muffled now. All right, and then we also have Greg Sherry on the line. I just made him a panelist. What? Yeah, I have the mic on. Is it, Greg it does sound muffled. Can you understand us if we speak slowly and distinctly? Is that a no from everybody? It, it's just everyone sounds like they're far in the distance. Let me see if I can get some earbuds. Carrie Kaler. Present. Was that better, commissioners? Did that sound better, guys, at home? How's everybody doing? Doing good, Greg. <laughs> We have a quorum, Madam Chair. We have a quorum, and we want to welcome Carrie. She's our new commissioner. We welcome you. Thank you so much. Give us a, a 30 second background of how long you've been here and what your background is. Well, I am a, a recent transplant to Bastrop, but I grew up halfway between Austin and Bastrop, out off 969. Uh, I currently am the director of development for a small city just west of Austin. Uh, called Rolling Wood, if you're familiar. And um, I, before that, I worked for an architecture firm. For Terrific. Years. Well, welcome. Thank you. I'll move on to item number two, it's citizen comments. This is the time when we will would it, uh, invite citizens to come forward. Uh, do we have any comments that have come in? Or I see no one here. At this time, we have the plan email up and running in case we do get any comments from the public, and at this time, there have been none, Madam Chair. Thank you. If anyone wants to make any comments about anything that's not on the agenda, feel free to send in your email. Items for individual consideration is number three. 3A is consider action to approve meeting minutes from the August 27 Planning and Zoning Commission meeting. Have you all had a chance to look them over? Are there any additions, corrections, or amendments? Motion to approve. Motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Second by Glenn. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. And since Carrie wasn't here, she'll probably abstain. I'll abstain. Okay. okay. Item 3B, consider action to approve the revised preliminary plat for the Colony Mud 1B Section 5 and 6 being 31.583 acres out of the Jose Manuel Bangs Survey Abstract 5, located west of FM 969 at the west extension of Sam Houston Boulevard within the statutory extraterritorial jurisdiction of Bastrop, Texas, as shown in Exhibit A of our packet. Ms. Bills. Colin leaves me on my presentation, so I know what I'm talking about. So uh, what, the first thing we have before you tonight is a revised preliminary plat. Uh, this, they, had a, they did a preliminary plat for the entire section of uh, the Colony Mud 1B uh, back in, the, um, I think, July of last year. It was uh, the date that that got approved. Back then it went to, you, to the Planning and Zoning Commission and then City Council. We've since revised the rules, and now Planning and Zoning is the deciding uh, body for uh, all plats. So 
And the city council didn't act on it because? No, they did act on it. They, they approved it. They did July. approve it. Okay. Yeah, they did approve it in July. But you, you guys reviewed and recommended, and then they approved it back in July for the entire area of 1B. And this, okay. So what they're requesting today is a revision to um, a couple sections within 1B. So within 1B, they've kind of, they've phased it out into uh, six different sections. And what they're looking at to, is uh, revising two of those sections. If you look at the map on the screen, the large, the blue area. Are you flipping back and forth, Colin? I don't know right now. So. Oh, okay. Uh, there's a, the, the larger blue area is the colony mud uh, full development, uh, which at full build out will be 4,300 LUEs of uh, utility service, uh, which is going to be a few less uh, homes than that, but it'll be probably around 4,000 living units out there. Um, so what they're, uh, the Colony Mud 1B is the second phase um, going west from 969, FM 969. Colony Mud 1A is largely platted, they've got most of that platted and most of that infrastructure on the ground already for those lots. Um, they've started some of the other sections of the Mud 1B and what, with the market changes, with the way things are selling out there, they're coming in to revise sections five and six to make them smaller lots. Um, section five uh, was laid out in the preliminary plat as 60 foot lots, and they're wanting to reduce those to 50 foot lots. Um, for section six, those had been 80 foot lots, and they're wanting to make those smaller 45 foot lots. Both of those uh, lot types are allowed in their consent agreement, which is the overarching document that regulates uh, the colony mud. Uh, because they are within our statutory ETJ. Uh, with this uh, amendment to their preliminary plat, um, they've already done, uh, we were still kind of under our old process, so they've done the preliminary drainage, preliminary infrastructure as part of that preliminary plat. This does not change any of the stormwater, the, the water lines, or the wastewater lines for this section. Um, it's just increasing the density a little. Um, it's by about 20, by 22 units, so. That is what um, they're requesting. So this, from this preliminary plat, the next thing, they'll come, they'll finalize their public improvement plans, and then they'll come in with a final plat uh, once they build that infrastructure or put down a fiscal uh, surety in order to do the, that infrastructure. So that's what the, this first one is. Uh, the DRC reviewed for consistency with our regulations and the uh, colony consent agreement and they recommended approval of this uh, uh, revised preliminary plat. As submitted. As submitted. Mm -hmm. As submitted in your packet. Okay. Was everybody at home able to understand? Jennifer, do you have any questions? I'll go with you guys no, first good. since you're not here. Hello. Are we have, able to talk? We're, <laughs> I don't have any questions, but it's still a little bit hard to hear everything. It is still hard it, to hear. It is. My fault. I'm not able to make out much of what's being said. Okay, well, maybe we'll talk a little slower. Okay. And it might be a little bit easier to hear. Um, Carrie, do you have anything you want to ask? No, okay. not right now. Okay. Glenn? Uh, I, have I don't have any questions. I have a question. Uh, the, I missed all the sentence that 22 minutes you said. Is that the, the drainage in the... In the uh, 22 so, lots. Oh, 20. oh, the 22 lots. Yeah, okay. they're increasing the overall lot count of the entire section from 370 to 392. Okay, is there, with uh, 22 more lots, is you say there's no significant change in the drainage, no. stormwater drainage. No, they, they'd oversize their drainage to be able to handle. It's because they were they would have built larger houses with larger amenities on those, and so it'll be the same amount of impervious cover. Okay, thank you. Did you guys understand Jennifer's answer at home? Did you hear? Yes, I heard it and I understood. I don't have any questions and it's basically no change in the drainage. Is that, was the question correct? Correct. Yeah. Yeah, we're currently That's under review for their public improvement plans um, for these sections and have looked at that increase that, so we know it doesn't uh, impact 
the infrastructure. Okay. Anybody else have any other questions? If not, I'll entertain a motion. I would move to adopt the revised preliminary plan. Motion to approve. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Kerry. Call the roll, please, ma'am. Absolutely, Madam Chair. Glenn Johnson? Uh, yes. Carrie Kaler? Yes. Debbie Moore? Yes. All right. Cheryl Lee? Yes. Greg Sherry? Yes. Ishmael Harris? Yes. Pablo Cerna? Yes. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Charlotte? Okay. We're having a little technology glitch here and there, so yeah, please bear with is, us. This is the, the challenge when we have the, the half in, half out meetings. They're a little more challenging than the all in person or the all online. <laughs> That's okay. We'll move on to Let item 3B. Learn. So, uh, move on to item. By the time you get everything straight, we'll be back to normal. Exactly. Again. That's okay. how it'll That's, work. And we'll work that way. Item 3B, consider action to approve the revised preliminary plat for the Colony Mud 1B Section 5 and 6. No, you're I'm sorry, I just did. I thought it sounded familiar. <laughs> Item 3C, consider action to approve the West Bastrop Village Phase 1 Section 1 preliminary plat consisting of 25.557 acres out of the Nancy Blakey Survey Number 98 located west of FM 20 within the statutory extraterritorial jurisdiction, or ETJ, of the city of Bastrop, Texas, shown as Exhibit A. A? Yes, okay. A. Mm -hmm. Ms. Bills. So this is the first section of the West Bastrop Village Municipal Utility District. So this is a project that's been in the works for quite a while that we've seen a couple different iterations of it over the years. They originally got their uh, consent agreement and a, a de plan development agreement master plan for this development back in 2006 um, due to market downturns, different challenges, and then utility challenges it's taken until now that we're finally to the point that they're um, getting their plats on the ground and starting to get ready for when they're able to turn around some houses. So part of that is that, uh, getting their wastewater and water um, capacity for the, the mud district. Um, so what they're com coming forward to, you see this is on the location map. The red area is the entire development. The pink area is what we're uh, discussing today, the first phase. Um, the, at full build out, it'll be 1,200 units of residential and, about, and up to 125,000 uh, units of or square feet of commercial space with at least 15.3 acres of civic space and 75 acres of open space. That's what their master plan calls for for this development. Um, in this area, they are in our statutory ETJ. Um, they're regulated by their plan development agreement and consent agreement with the city, which was uh, adopted in 2006. Uh, this is the first uh, section one, fa phase one. I think I have that backwards on there. It's phase one, section one. Um, I have it backwards on my staff report. That's where I have it backwards. So, I'm like, somewhere I'm backwards. Okay. So, you can see the lot layout here on the screen. They have two points of access with this uh, section. The main thoroughfare for the development will be Weaverton Boulevard to the south that comes off of FM20. Uh, they're working with TxDOT. Um, eventually, that'll be a signalized light when they, the warrants hit and the development gets big enough. Uh, there will be a, a signal, traffic signal at that intersection. Uh, they also have a planned, what TxDOT tells me to be a right in, right out um, uh, intersection to the north at, I've lost the name of that street, but it's um, a right in, right out means they can only turn you know, right um, from the driving lane into it and then right out of it. They can't turn across traffic to go into that driveway. So you, there won't need to be a signal at that intersection. <coughs> All of these lots are alley-loaded, so you can see that there's four main thoroughfares uh, that they'll 
um, that the houses will front onto, and then they have private alleys that'll be in the back that they will take uh, parking access off of. There are three reserve lots to the front. Two of those will be a future commercial space, and one will be a drainage uh, open space lot for this section. Uh, this, er this area is uh, a little over 25 acres. It's 91 lots. And um, the, the lots range anywhere from about 4,000 square feet up to uh, 6,000 square feet. And 72 got left on there from something else. <laughs> this is what happens when I do my presentations late at night. Uh, the DRC reviewed this on the August 13th meeting and uh, deemed it to be an administratively complete and recommended approval uh, of this plat, as does the assistant planning director. Any questions? I have one. Okay. Since this has been laying waste for a long time, uh, I remember seeing it on more than one occasion. It was initially developed under old development rules that we had and planning and zoning rules that we had. Do they comport with everything we have now? Any of the changes that we may have made as far as drainage or anything else? Yes, so they, they do, so when they, they vested to their standards, so their lot standards, their road, their road layout, all of that is in their agreement and that's um, what they can, um, how they can lay everything out and develop under. Drainage standards, utility standards, those all have to come up to our current codes. So this is all using our new drainage manual. They actually went through our new process, so the city engineer did approve the preliminary drainage plan and the preliminary infrastructure plan based off of all of our um, updated um, stormwater manual and construction manuals. And Carol, you'll hear the words DRC a lot at the Design Review Committee. It's a group of folks that get together and look at the drainage and, the, and how it comports with all of our rules. And it's a, a, a project's not accepted or a proposal's not accepted until this committee all agrees that it's up to our standards. So you'll okay. be hearing that a lot. Thank you. And sure. I will say this development overall, the West Bastrop Village, when they came in in 2006, the reason why they did it, you know, as a mud and had to have a, a, a specific agreement was they were trying to get those denser lots, those alley loaded um, units, um, all the things that actually do conform uh, a, lot, a lot more closely with our B3 code than it did our previous codes. So. Anybody at home have any questions? I, mean, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, are, when they go before the DRC, do they also turn in a, a, like an illustrative plan of the overall concept, or is it strictly this type of uh, regulating plan? Uh, they do have uh, they, their development, uh, their plan development agreement has all of that in it already. So they actually, within that document, have an overall master plan that lays out the streets and gener general kind of uh, lot layouts. And then they, and within that, it has very specific standards for lot sizes, lot uses, and then um, different, in, in their document they went as far as specific cro street cross sections and um, examples of development. So it's, it's a, actually a fairly long document um, that they really locked down. So they, I would imagine they may come back in the future and want to revise that since it was set in 2006. Markets have changed. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if in the near future after they get these first several sections rolling, they may want to revise the overall master plan. Do we know how quickly when they um, work on the housing units, they're going to be incorporating the commercial aspect of it? Or? They, they, they right now are focused on this first residential section, trying to get that going. What the big, one of the holdups is that the city's been working with them for several years to be the wholesale wastewater um, service for this development. So they will serve and take care of all the infrastructure for the wastewater inside the development. The city will wholesale that service. What was holding that up was the construction of our new wastewater treatment plant, which is underway. Um, so this is trying to line up with that. So I think they're still kind of waiting till that, you know, this section gets on the ground to start looking at those commercial sections. So. I'm sorry, and I'm having, again, still a hard time, but she, I think part of my question was asked, the commercial, um, the commercial piece, that's at the front. Can you go back to that screen? Uh, Colin will have to flip me over. Yeah. 
Yeah, so in their plan, they, they call out a couple of commercial, they, they do have a town center in the middle of the entire development um, with the road layout, because that Weaverton, they also have another access, you can see how it touches 71, that they'll be able to come in with the main entrance off of that, that 71. So they'll have a couple entry points into this development, and they do have kind of some planned town centers, but they do have some reserved space along 21, or 20, for um, some, some smaller commercial. They're not huge lots, so they would mostly be things that could serve the development right off of the, the and highway. It, and is that commercial development for their use or for the it would The, 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 streets, the streets will be publicly dedicated so and publicly accessible. They don't have any plans to gate anything, so this will be accessible to the public. So yeah, the, any, anyone could use that commercial. Okay. Uh, it'd be good to see that those other drawings. Maybe just trying to wrap my mind around the drawings here. It'd be nice to see some of those other plans. Maybe not all of them, but uh, at least what they're thinking long term. Uh, I did have a question though, but it's, it was alluded to about how um, this is not on city sewer yet. Uh, so you're saying, can you go over how that's going to be handled? Uh, um, is it on septic? So no, it will be on city sewer. That's this is they're at the preliminary prelimin, can't say preliminary plat stage. They're basically getting all of their entitlements for the preliminary plat, their public improvement plans, all of those lined up. So when the sewer plant comes online, they'll be able to um, to put those units on the ground. They they have some offsite improvements that there are also in the. Uh, review of the city engineer that he's uh, approved those as well that has the the main line going back to our new uh, wastewater treatment plant. Is so, it going through the alley? Are they using the alleys for a lot of the utilities? I believe so. Uh, Trey may. Well, so the, the main sewer is going through what we call East Bastrop Village. It's going through that that property that's uh, it's between the, the, the RV park and um, Shiloh Road, it cuts across that property, but uh, the, the, for the lines within the development, I believe the, the sewer lines are going along the main, the main thoroughfare roads, and the telecoms and I think electric are going in the alleys. So, uh, to kind of go along with what Pablo is asking about the, the treatment of whatever, the water, the waste treatment of that neighborhood, what kind of impact is that? Have they looked at that, the impact that it's going to have on our future treatment plant? Or yes, even, they, yeah, they say the future treatment plant. So we have an agreement with them that Trey has been working very hard on for the last little bit <laughs> that, yeah. that locks down how much uh, capacity they, that they're reserving in that new plant. So. Okay. Because how many uh, residents are, is expected to be there? Uh, so a uh, full build out will be 1,200 uh, units, but 1,200 units. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that's a huge impact on our treatment system. But okay. they they have been one of the driving forces for getting the new wastewater treatment plant in place. So they have been definitely taken into account with the sizing of the new facility. Right. Okay. Thank you. I think that answers. So my, my last question about the uh, the alleys, uh, I think that's a great concept. I'm really in favor of using alleys to put as much, uh, you know, infrastructure in there. And I had a question about the, uh, I guess, the fire hydrants, the location. Are we uh, encouraging that to happen in the alley or are those happening outside in the streets? Those are happening outside in the streets. The, all of the fire access so that all, will be served from the, the streets, the alleys, um, while a fire truck could theoretically get down them, that, that there's more room in the streets to, there's, only, there's no parking on one side of all those streets to leave room for fire access. So all the, all the access or the garage will be from the alley? Mm hmm yes. That's what I thought. And there's no concern with fire access with the ingress and egress being on one side of the development and not on the other side of the development? Uh, the houses? The houses, yeah. Yeah, well, that's how all houses are now, because usually you have two rows of houses that back up to each other. And the but, I mean, they're, they're laid out longitudinally, and you have access from 20 and from 71, but this end has no, no exit if, oh, in case okay. of fire. 
So right now they have two they have two ways in and out for the 91 units, and, and that meets fire. Meets fire is reviewed. They're part of our development review committee, so they have reviewed this plan and all the public improvement plans as well. They're okay. part of that that review. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? No, I, and then going back to the alleys. Okay. I'll wait. Someone okay. had a question. Okay, Glenn, go ahead. Well, okay. to follow up on. Going back to the. Hang on, Pablo. When, when is this? Is this? Uh, you're saying that there will be other exits on the western side of this track as it builds out, right? There will be another one on to 71, and there will be potentially one to the south. Um, that's up to TxDOT on um, how many exits they can have on to FM20. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Pablo? So, so there's, there's only two ways to get in, right? That's what we're saying? Uh, for this section, yes. Okay. For future sections, there will be additional, uh, there will be some additional ways in and out. So. Pablo? Okay, and going back to the alleys and, and utilities, um, and, and I'm, I'm not an expert on it, but are we, gonna, are we looking at then fire lines for each of those streets, the Werverton, Gouda, and Axel? If we ran them in the alleys, would that be one fewer fire line? Or, or and, you know, that one of the, the benefits of having an alley is you can, you can, you know, run your utilities for both sides of those lots uh, but i mean i'm not the engineer on this but i was wondering was that was that talked about with the developer um i i know fire has reviewed this and has met all of our uh 2018 international fire code requirements for uh this subdivision so uh, I, I know our our assistant fire chief who's our fire marshal has reviewed it he had he had a lot of back and forth with the engineers so i know it's meeting all of our our fire code that I feel that it'll be adequately protected. So. Yeah, I think it is. I was just wondering if we could get by, you know, with running the u utilities in the alleys. One of the benefits of having alleys is the, the ability to run your utilities down the alley and serve both sides of those uh, those lots, uh, top and bottom, as I'm looking at the plan. And I don't know if that was discussed. I'm just airing this out because I had a question about it. And it, it was not discussed during the review. I got you. Would the alley, wouldn't the alley just be smaller in terms of being able to get utilities back there? Would the, are the alleys designed, going to be designed to be smaller than the main road where the hydrants would go? Yes, the main, the main roads are, I believe, 28 feet of pavement, and the, the alleys are 20, 20 feet. Well, the 20 feet of right-of-way, they'll be narrower in pavement, so... Um, I think the alleys are, I want to say, 18 feet. But they may, I ha would have to look at the public improvement plans to see the actual widths. But it wasn't, they weren't wide enough to take fire access off of. So, Plus the way that they're designed, they're, they're not, the, the fire truck couldn't turn around in them, which is the bigger concern. Well, and that's what I was going to get to. I saw that the, uh, the radius... On, on those on the, their label and there's a table down there and there's a 15 foot turning radius uh, and, and I mean you probably could get a fire truck in there I've seen this done in some other places and they ran the fire lane or the the, uh, the, the water for the fire hydrants down the alleys and I thought that was pretty smart so I don't know if that's a better way to go or not I'm just raising the concern that you know it, Wait. it looks like if we did fire lines on each of the streets and we have three fire lines. If you ran them down the alleys, it looks like you could get by with two, and then that vertical one on alley F, but that was just me thinking out loud. Yeah, I, I, I will say I'm the, the engineer, the, the design engineer for the uh, developer submitted what, of course, they feel is the best value engineering, and it meets our codes. So, um, okay. which is what, if it meets our codes, then it, it, it passes muster for our subdivision. Right, rules, so. it's not something we can dictate. But we take over the utilities when it's all built out, no. correct? No, we do not in this case. The utilities for this subdivision will be taken over by the municipal utility district. Oh, okay. Yeah. So okay. we don't, within this, within this, we don't take over the utilities. So that, that does play a little bit into their design because, I mean, they are going to be responsible for that. Um, 
through at least the life of the, the municipal utility debt. Uh, the cities cannot an annex municipal utilities until, unless we're willing to take over their debt, which usually we are not. Um, so that, that usually has a shelf life of 25 to 35 years. So we're looking at this being owned by the municipal utility district for the next 25 to 35 years, if not forever. So. <laughs> Anything? Yeah, that's all I had. Anything else? Any question? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. I'll motion to approve the uh, Carrie, move to approve. Is there a second? I second Second. That. Check it by Glenn. Call the roll, please, ma'am. Absolutely, Madam Chair. Debbie Hello. Moore? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, no. Carrie Kaler? Yes. Glenn Johnson? Yes. All right. Debbie Moore? Yes. Cheryl Lee? Yeah. Greg Sherry? Yes. Ishmael Harris? Oh, yes. Pablo Serna? Oh. Yes. Motion carries. Carries unanimously. Thank you, everybody. Now we will convene into our workshop session of item 4A for discussion on Bastrop Building Block B3 code related to subdivision authority, including but not limited to why is it important, local government code chapter 212, municipal regulations of subdivisions in property development, 1445 interlocal agreement with Bastrop County for extraterritorial jurisdiction subdivision review, could you make those words any longer? <laughs> Uh, platting exemptions and exception, major thoroughfare map and grid system, direction for B3 code updates. So just a reminder, last meeting we kind of went over a schedule, tentative schedule of that the, over the next several months, uh, staff is going to bring several topics forward um, from the B3 codes that we've, um, now that we've had a year to implement the code and really work with it. Um, to bring any modifications uh, that we would like you all to consider and uh, give, a, give us some direction on. The first one we, we really wanted to delve into was the subdivision. Um, and we're going to start tonight with, um, we have Matthew Lewis here. He, was the, he, uh, his, he and his staff helped us craft uh, the B3 code. Um, and he's helping us, uh, he's an extension of our team to really help us uh, delve deep into this topic and come up with creative solutions and make sure we're still meeting the intent of uh, Bastrop being fiscally sustainable, authentically Bastrop, and geographically sensitive. So I'll let Matt kind of start, you know, the discussion with why is platting important? Uh, All right. Oh, okay. Either way. I'll sit back here so you can be up there if you want to, Jennifer. And that I can see all of them as well. Commissioner, or Chair, would you like me to step up there? Would can you? everybody at home hear Mr. Lewis? Can you all hear me okay? I hear better, but it's still, I just have to explain. Why don't you oh. get up here, Matt, if you can. Sure. Good evening, commissioners. Matt Lewis, Simple City Design Chair, um, Vice Chairs. Um, today we're here to talk about platting. And I think that the two items that you all had on your agenda today and the questions you ask emphasize why platting is important. So you all kind of highlighted these reasons, ingress, egress, water lines, placement of infrastructure. Oftentimes communities are actually built by um, their plat standards. A, as you noticed and stated by staff today, um, we can't deny a subdivision that meets your minimum standards. And so if you require a D minus for your community, you will achieve a D minus for your community. If you ask for an A plus or a B plus, you'll get a B plus because it's, it's setting your standards for your development patterns of what you want to become and how you actually get to uh, those results. Platting is the legal creation of buildable parcels of land. And, Platting is regulated by state law as well as local subdivision ordinances. Um, you look at this development pattern on the screen here and you will notice that each of the individual uh, components, oh, please work, okay, are separated. So you'll have schools located here separated from the housing. You'll notice these housing types look different from these housing types. And it creates a series of disconnected and isolated pods. These types of development patterns come with great challenges. 
They are, uh, require ex extensive, uh, extensive and expensive infrastructure. Uh, it requires long distances to travel from place to place. It creates an uh, isolation of disconnected housing types, different socioeconomic classes. Uh, the isolation of services requires you to have to drive across the street to access you know, your basic necessities. We've been plotting for a long time, and humans have been building settlements for centuries, right? Here's the original town plat of Bastrop. And look at how calm, organized, and um, well laid out and defined this pattern of development is versus the previous pattern. The reason that this is important is because your platting standards will establish the rules and parameters for what you are trying to accomplish. We changed the platting standards and the um, transportation standards here with the B3 code. And we'll go through those standards and what they mean uh, throughout this presentation. Uh, the emphasis of today is really going to be highlighting on the extraterritorial jurisdiction and the area outside of your jurisdictional city limit boundaries, which you have very fine-grained codes on that provide the framework for a timeless, authentic, and fiscally sustainable um, community, which is what we've been using currently. Platting basics. The governance of platting is facilitated through state law, chapter 212, and by way of the B3 code. What we did in Bastrop was one of the most um, uh, bold attempts at reducing platting standards where we're not over-regulating and we're allowing some market trends to shift, yet you're still getting good development patterns. And these development patterns are critical to the long-term success of the community. So essentially what was done in the B3 codes was a direct correlation and adoption of Chapter 212 with not many standards above Chapter 212, including no minimum lot dimensions uh, within Bastrop. This is uh, pretty unheard of in the state of Texas. I don't know anyone else that's doing this, but it seems to be going really well, and the developments that are being facilitated through this code are um, going to be dramatically different and better than what you've had and seen previously based off of my humble opinion of these development patterns. Platting provides precise uh, descriptions of the land being divided um, and they're mapped and then they're communicated via text. These are the um, physical boundaries on the ground of how the actual land will be subdivided into buildable lots. Plats provide public uh, lands and utilities required by the code. This includes streets, drainage, parks, civic space, those characteristics. Plats ensure that land is uh, divided, uh, meets all state law and B3 code requirements. And plats provide orderly development patterns to ensure that the uh, legal sale of the land is possible. Oops, I'm rolling through here, and I, oops, sorry, hold on, hold on. Jennifer's coming up in this part. Okay, Jennifer, do you want to cover the two types of plats? We're, we're tag team in this presentation today. So within the city limits, we have two uh, types of plats, and a lot of that is dictated by Chapter 212. Um, and then we um, further have standards within, or processes within the B3 code. So we have two different plats. A standard plat helps you do the initial platting. Um, it gives you a process for plat modifications and is a public process. So that's what you've seen tonight, is we first have the prelim preliminary plat that comes in and lays out an entire subdivision. Um, with that, before they, the preliminary plat comes to you, they've done some engineering to make sure that the roads are going to work, that they can get water lines looped appropriately through that, and they get the whole development. Sometimes the, some of them like to come in, you know, 91 lots at a time. We've had some come in, you know, and plat 400 lots at a time, and then break them down in smaller final plats. Um, so our st after um, the preliminary plaque gets established, that document can um, live for several years while they're building out that full development. Uh, after the preliminary plat, they come in with individual public improvement plans. And this is part of where the, the local government code gives us the authority to plat. Our local rules are what sets the standards for what kind of utilities need to go in the ground to be able to serve different kinds of development what kind of a street needs to go there, how, how do you build that street? All those rules come in in that platting stage with the public improvement plans. 
once would that we make sure that infrastructure will be in place to serve the lots, then that's when they come in with the final plat, that that's the official document that lays out the, those depictions, those text documents um, that, that give you your legal lot, that you go file that plat at the courthouse and that is, draws the, the subdivision out. So you can kind of see um, a basic kind of layout of how we see a block in the city you know, laying out with different, different size lots and all of those would have the appropriate streets, appropriate utilities that run to each lot um, to serve the different types of development in that. We also have administrative plat processes. Those are for smaller projects and those can be um, administratively reviewed and approved uh, by staff. That power is given through the local government code. Those involve uh, what's called a minor plat, which is for four or fewer lots that don't require the extension of infrastructure and don't require the platting of new streets. Um, it's also for um, amending plats is one you'll see, and that's for tweaks to a property line, someone built their fence wrong, they need to move the line over, they need to remove a line because the lot wasn't quite big enough. Those kind of um, administrative plats uh, are approved by staff. Um, occasionally, some commercial replats can be also administratively approved. Uh, within the RB3 code, we have a flowchart that gives you the basic development process. And this is what, is, this is how we develop a subdivision in the city limits. It starts with your character district and your place type. So when we developed the B3 code, it's what planners like to call a unified development code. It really intertwines your subdivision and your zoning standards. So we start with our character districts, which is a development pattern type. You have your traditional neighborhood development, which is more of your grid streets. You have village center development, which lays out a center and has the developments um, kind of radiate from, out from that village center. And then you have cluster development, which allows you to do denser pockets of development with a, lo a larger conservation space around to take advantage of, especially in um, geographically sensitive areas. In our code, we evaluate that in your place type, whether or not you're a P3, which is a residential use, or a P5, which is your um, denser um, commercial mixed use category. Once those are established, then we start looking at how big is your property. Um, for infill developments, um, you have lesser requirements. You may not have to plat. When you have um, larger developments and you need to start establishing those place types, you have to do what's either called a zoning concept scheme that lays out your uses, lays out your streets, which then feeds into your platting process, or a neighborhood regulating plan, which all, you don't have to change your underlying place type, but it still ha ha has you establish what type of streets you're doing, how those uh, lots are gonna be oriented in the, each block. So this is how the platting works in the city limits. Once you get the platting done, then we have development standards that give you your, well, you have your block standards, you have your different street types, you have different civic spaces that are required within those plats. We also have, um, that's pretty unique uh, to Bastrop, is our master transportation plan. With the B3 code, we also adopted this as part of our uh, transportation plan is we proactively laid out a gridded network of our 720 foot block structure. And that 720 foot block structure is, ties back to our farm lots. So that, that map, uh, that, uh, the original town tract that Matt showed you earlier was broken down into 720 foot farm lots, or roughly there, and 330 foot building blocks. So that's our backbone for how uh, we see the city developing. The benefits of this, one of the challenges we had in our old uh, standard of subdivision was we would require each development, if they did a, we're gonna create a certain amount of traffic, they had to do their own traffic impact analysis. Well, they would do theirs, and then someone else would do theirs down the street. If they were going on at the same time, they didn't know what the other person was doing, it wasn't accurately reflecting the full traffic impact. By creating a grid, you create a network of streets that create parallel routes that allow people to, if one street is busy or has a traffic jam, you can move to another parallel route. So the grid alleviates a lot of that need for traffic impact analysis and um, trying to figure out if, if you're dumping you know, 800 houses onto this one intersection, what is that going to do? Instead, you'll have multiple ways in and out for those subdivisions uh, for those 800 homes.
And just a, a, for reference, the grid was only adopted in your statutory ETJ, this, yeah. this uh, master transportation plan. Yeah, so you'll see it, the, the, those white lines just kind of stop at a certain point, and that's the edge of our statutory ETJ, which goes into platting in the ETJ. So the city in our current size, we have a by right, it's called a one mile statutory ETJ. For the size of Bastrop, that's what the, the local government code gives us um, as a planning area. It gives us a buffer of that area that may someday be in the city limits or will definitely impact um, adjacent city, pro uh, city limits properties. Uh, so we're the subdivision authority in that region. We also have a much larger voluntary extraterritorial jurisdiction. <laughs> that was um, annexed into the uh, ETJ in the 80s, late, mid to late 80s, in response to development pressure from Austin. So you'll see we have three different colors. The dark green area is our statutory area. The, the middle green area is our area A, and the lighter green is area B. So area A and area B are our voluntary <laughs> ETJ. Area A is the section that the city um, has agreed to be the regulatory authority for with the county. So we have what's called, and that was why I linked all the different documents that feed into where do we get our subdivision authority from. And uh, just to make note, if you look at the scale of the land area of your statutory city limits in comparison to your statutory ETJ to the optional area of Bastrop, that's your future city limits possibly. It's your future growth areas. It establishes your corridors, your gateways into town. Um, the land area and the jurisdiction that Bastrop has is very fortunate to have that area. It's a beautiful countryside. It's, it is the quintessential drive out of the city into this beautiful small town. And to preserve and protect those, those view corridors and that landscape um, is within y'all's jurisdiction from an environmental standpoint, from a subdivision standpoint, from a signage standpoint. And so some of the key characteristics that it requires to establish good development patterns um, are within your jurisdiction. So we thought this map was extremely imperative for you all to see and, and appreciate the um, massive land area outside of what we consider Bastrop that is really uh, Bastrop's jurisdictional areas. Yeah, the other important part to note is a lot of that is upstream on the Colorado River, which is our primary water source and recreation for the city. So that's something we want to make sure is protected as development occurs, especially along that nine, 969 corridor. Um, part of the reason why the state gives cities these uh, regulatory authorities for subdivision, they also give some limited, um, but we have uh, stormwater uh, uh, regulation, signage regulation, and potentially driveway regulation, depending on how our 1445 is set up. Um, those are all things that feed into the safety uh, and well being of the city and the surrounding areas. Those are all. Um, things the state uh, felt was important to allow cities to regulate outside of their corporate city limits. So why it's important, it could be our potential future city limits. There have been... Yeah. Area A is city and county. What's, who regulates Area B? The county. Just so the, Just the county. Just the county. So what, so what happens is Everything in the statutory and area A come to the city. We are, it's our subdivision regulations that apply. We do provide the county with a, uh, they, they participate in our review, but it's our regulations that apply for, for area B. They are the primary um, reviewer and they give us a review as well. So we do talk back and forth in those areas on how they impact each other. Once it is subdivided, however, um, development permits and uh, for actually building structures, those go through the county. So that's why setting, making sure it's set up right in the subdivision can impact the future development patterns and growth in, outside of our city limits. So that kind of feeds into why it's important to, it could be our future city limits. There have been in recent years some uh, changes made to our annexation authority. And, and I, that is to be said though, state can take it away, they could also give it back to us in the future. So we don't want to necessarily turn our back to the ETJ and say, well, we're never going to be out there because, and we may not, we may not be out there, but it still impacts the city limits. So that's why 
it can be important. It's the gateway into our city. Everyone is driving along 71, 969. That's how they get to us from Austin. It also provides um, our stormwater infrastructure and protects our waterways. Um, future street network, traffic can be uh, something that we'll all experience going that direction. We wanna make sure um, that those, that's taken care of coming to and from the city. And just to ensure orderly development um, because it, it maintains everyone's property values and ensures that you don't have um, utility um, shortfalls out in those areas in the future because they weren't properly planned. So I have a, I have a, I have a question. Sure. Oh, maybe that's what you're about to explain. I think, I think that's what you're about to explain. Okay. I'll, I'll explain it if you have a question that you can ask. So we have, okay. uh, with the county, um, at some point in the 90s, the state said, you, one, if you have this area that overlaps, City and county work together and figure out which one of you regulates it. Don't make people go to both of you. So in the House Bill 1445 said, pick which one, of, who's in charge. So the city and county adopted uh, the 1445 interlocal agreement, that, and that's the point at which we split out that um, voluntary ETJ area on whose, whose rules are applicable, what rules even in the statutory ETJ are applicable to um, the city versus the county. So with that, that's, that's what gives us our authority that they come to us if it's a statutory or area A, they go to the county if it's area B. So one of the things we're, we're hoping to get some feedback from y'all um, on this, with subdivision, there are also some, and I went over this briefly a, a couple meetings ago, we also have um, exceptions or exemptions from platting. So we would uh, like some feedback on when you think those are appropriate um, for different developments. One that's set in the local government code is for uh, properties greater than five acres that don't require extension of public, inf uh, public improvements. So th there's, uh, there's some built in. Within our current code, we've built in what we've always liked to call the lot of record or the legal lot standard, that if you existed as of April 20th, 1981, and you haven't changed your lot and you have street access, that will acknowledge that your lot um, has, has standing and you don't have to plat. But if you've changed your lot lines post, after that date, you do have to come into compliance with our subdivision regulations. So those are some of the exemptions and exceptions. There may be some others that we see as appropriate that we may bring forward. Um, and if you have had any feedback, one of the things that we're wanting to do is to maybe t tie some of those triggers to the county um, development permits as well. That's how they use, people know they, they need to plat is usually they go to the county to get their development permit. The county checks to see if they have um, a, a lot of record, and they send them to us to get that letter. So that's where the platting usually comes in in the uh, ETJ. One of the ways, um, since we're, our goal with subdivision regulation is to um, protect health and safety, Se uh, on-site septics or sewer permits is one way to do that because that's a big trigger for how big your lots have to be. If you have well access, you need certain size requirements of lots. So one of the things, as I talked about, we have a unified development code, right? And we have our flow chart that starts with character districts and place types. We don't regulate use in the ETJ, we only regulate subdivisions. So we can't start in the green bar on the flow chart, we have to just start with subdivision regulation in the ETJ. And we don't have clear triggers. The main the main thing that we're, we have right now is that master transportation plan that if you, sh in the statutory ETJ, that you have to build to that block structure. <laughs> Past that, we don't have any lot standards um, in, um, or smaller blocks standards than that. So that's one thing that we're going to come back with is some proposals for um, different subdivision standards. We, in our previous code, did have uh, city standards that tied to the zoning, and then we had subdivision standards for the extraterritorial jurisdictions, usually called the rural standards. So we're gonna look at some of those on bringing those back. And 
adopting some street standards for those that make sense for rural development. A lot of our, we have 11 different cross sections in our code. Um, any of those could be applied if it's in the appropriate place. There may be some additional rural standards that we need to look at to, to provide the right level of uh, development for the county. Some of the um, items that were, I mean, managing growth in the ETJ in the state of Texas is difficult because there, we don't have land use regulations in the ETJ. Um, and so utilizing the tools that we have most effectively to secure uh, upstream stormwater management detention ponds uh, so that you don't have downstream flow issues or small area flooding um, could be taken care of in these issues. I'm sorry, in these areas, um, establishing um, if development occurs, what the threshold of disturbance would be before triggering platting. State law exempts anything uh, over five acres that would allow them to plat um, by right, by state law. And so are there items in there that we can align with the county because five acre tracks may have um, additional buildings on them that are requiring uh, on-site septic permits that they're getting from this, the county and the city may not be aware that this is going on because all of it's staying under the radar for uh, the jurisdictional review of the city. And what's happening is it's uh, piecemealing developments out there and it can create areas where lots may not have public uh, frontage and so you can get colonials. Those types of things are really um, uh, detrimental long term because they're extremely difficult to go back and retrofit. They're hard to go back and try and acquire access easements to put roads across properties that have been sold by meets and bounds, which is like just a, uh, without actually going through the platting process, um, and then trying to come back and put these, these standards in place. So what we would like to um, um, seek direction on tonight is the allowance for us to go back and, and write clearly defined ETJ standards for subdivision, linking those standards to the, drain, uh, the stormwater management uh, system and the county's on-site septic permits. We believe if we could align these triggers and these processes, then a lot of the developments that are taking place in the ETJ that are slipping through the cracks would then be um, caught and brought to the forefront so that you're not dealing with issues later um, that are extremely complex. We can catch them on the front end, have a few headaches on the front end as we're going through this, but not have developments that are built you know, with infrastructure that doesn't meet your standards, with development patterns that don't emulate your, your goals or your um, um, your um, desires and you know maybe drainage was not even thought of and uh, now you have small area flooding in areas that you didn't have previously. Uh, so what we would love to do is come back with a series of uh, ETJ standards with road cross sections, alignment of these processes. We would work with the county, the city staff and uh, see if we can really pull this together to, to uh, streamline the ETJ process. Again as you saw the land area is so uh, massive we believe that it's imperative for the, the uh, city to uh, be on the forefront of addressing this um, rather than sitting back and waiting for a later date. I had a question. Can I ask a question? Yes. Yes, please. Okay. And, and Matt, you're kind of uh, headed towards what I was thinking uh, about development occurring in the ETJ and beyond. That's not really going to be uh, coordinated well between what we're trying to do is a big picture. And I'll say, for example, uh, it looks like development along 969 is going to happen pretty quick, like we're seeing it on 20 and 304. Um, but the way they're developing, they're just these drive-in type subdivisions. And uh, I know, take for example, uh, the, the presentation we had earlier with 3A, where they were thinking about commercial up on front along 20, it'd be great to try to coordinate that. I don't know how we would do that uh, outside on FM 969, but uh, to start to think about it in that way, that we want to have FM 969 be a, uh, be thought about that way so you don't just drive into it. You, you, there would be some shops along there. What are your thoughts? Yes, sir. That, uh, I think that's extremely important, and I'm, I'm glad you called attention to 969. Uh, 969 leaves MLK Boulevard in Austin, Texas. Um, it's a beautiful street, it's a historic street, and it terminates directly into downtown Bastrop. It's a beautiful drive, the, the countryside is gorgeous. I, I believe that Bastrop would be, um, it would be in the city's best interest to allocate that as a key corridor and to um, come up with standards. Again, it is in the extraterritorial jurisdiction, we don't have land use authority, but you do have subdivision authority, and you can regulate um, 
It regulates not even the word, guide. You can guide development patterns through your subdivision regulations with good, clear standards. And, and the hope is that we could really write standards that would allow for flexible development, um, not in uh, overly uh, costly developments, using rural cross sections instead of having straight line trees and curb and gutter, maybe it's meandering uh, and trails instead of formal paved sidewalks. So our hope is that we can bring back a series of tools to you all that would be um, applicable in the ETJ without trying to increase cost, but also still getting the quality of development that uh, the city deserves. Without dictating uh, land use, is there a way of directing development so that you have diversity, com like commercial corridor diversity? Um, you know, what I see coming up a lot of along that 969 corridor is a lot of service stations, a lot of, um, uh, you know, dollar generals, dollar trees, and, and creating, you know, situations where there's kind of a food desert or, or a services desert. And so, you know, I don't want to tell people you can have this and you can't have this, but at the same time, we have to, people who live in that area should be afforded the same benefits as people living in downtown Bastrop or, you know, downtown Austin, East Austin. So how do we, do you have recommendations for how to direct that? Um, one of the tools is going to be driveway standards. You'll notice you're getting a lot of curb cuts. Uh, it creates dangerous road patterns. It's, uh, you know, particularly in fast moving uh, lanes. Unfortunately, TxDOT's cross section that they're paving 969 actually is telling the landowners that you want curb cuts. When you have a, a center, continuous center turn lane, and it may be advantageous on that road based on the traffic patterns. I mean, I'm not the traffic engineer. I know they've done studies, but it, it, is, it directly correlates back to your land use patterns. It's sending signals. I believe the best tool that we're going to have is going to be through the subdivision authority. And that is going to be our, our key tool. So you can establish lot patterns that would allow for different uh, uses. And so, um, and maybe there's, there's no lot minimums, or, or maybe there are lot minimums that would help in certain areas. Uh, the the um, city it does have the jurisdictional authority to uh, determine where those patterns go and how. Uh, we could set corridors that we say this is a corridor, these are the lot standards along this corridor, these are how um, you build your setbacks into those standards. So it is possible to do that, um, but it's a, a, it, it gets complex and, and you know it's a policy decision as well. So what we would do is prepare something that would allow you all to do this and then take it to the policymakers and say, do you really want to do this? So, <laughs> our, our best way to influence uh, the development patterns and all that is through connectivity. So creating block standards um, that emulate, the, like, do we want just to, within area A, c continue our 720 block layout, um, either the layout or do we just want to have a minimum that you can't have any block longer than 720? Do we want to make some of those be 330 if you want to do certain types of, certain sizes of lots. Um, and then with our stormwater regulations, that's another way we can help guide some of that kind of, that development because um, your stormwater management rules will dictate the denser your development for commercial especially, then you'll have to um, do some additional development uh, costs in those. It would seem to me that it would be extremely beneficial to uh, act on this sooner than later. Yep. Um, it's hard to fix after it's already there. So although we can't dictate, and we, we really don't want to dictate, and we want to maintain the, the, the quality and the country feel and, and the beautiful drive that 969 is, um, if we can help to keep it that way by guiding and coming up with guidance the sooner the better, I think it would be very prudent of this group to do that. Anybody else have questions or comments? I think that I'm kind of, um, I'm, I'm much in favor of it. Um, I'm excited actually to know that this might even be a possibility because I've been greatly concerned about the saturation within the city limits. So to know that we have some options to expand, um, that is wonderful news for me. 
I, though, also think that if we are primarily focusing on placing a bunch of houses, particularly along 969, that um, we need to allow, we do need to allow, I would think, for some amenities um, for the people living along 969. And then with that, my concerns would be, it is, it is a very windy road. I actually don't, I actually don't enjoy driving it because it's so windy, especially at night. But that brings up concerns to me in, in terms of the traffic that is on that road. Traffic concerns, will the road, will the, would down, and I'm talking long term here, would the road need to be expanded to be um, four lanes across instead of just a middle lane for turning? Um, we, I mean, those are things we'd probably be talking about long term, but I do think in the short term, it should there should be some consideration for what other type of amenities just besides subdivisions what are we going to be providing for those people moving into those subdivisions I to, think the market um, accommodate it, those needs I think the market's going to determine that more than we ever would you know build it and they will come build it and you'll need to build other things too so I think what we want to do is you can build a lot of type of amenities that are attractive, or you can have amenities that ain't so cute. You know, we would like to set some guidance there for the amenities that are needed in order to try to keep the character and the beauty of that area while still providing for what the people of the area who are there now, in the near future, and the future ad infinitum, um, to set standards in for what they need and what will come while protecting and, well, and what I mean by amenities is like gas stations or like she said, the Dollar General. Right. And when I say right. amenities, that's what I mean. Things sure. that they can run around the corner and grab instead of having to come all the way into town. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I will say one of the you know, economic de development phrases we all use is uh, commercial follows rooftop. So the more residents you get in those areas, those those commercial developments will come eventually, and we just need to be able to make sure that we're requesting and requiring the right road types, right connectivity, to make sure all of those residential areas connect to the commercial areas. I, I believe, too, that last year, TxDOT allocated like $10 million to widen 969 between... It's, it's right at the edge of the Travis County border. So Is it? Yeah. Okay. So that TxDOT does have, and we do work with TxDOT and meet with them, somewhat regularly. Uh, we're planning to, to get that back going uh, to make sure we're meeting their vision and their needs too. Like we're not encouraging a development pattern that's against what TxDOT's planning. But um, I looked up the other day and they do plan to widen the entirety of 969, but it's in their plans for like 2045. Oh, It's a ways okay. out. So there are some others, but I will say like the colony development, that's one that with the, the quantity of development they're doing there, TxDOT has requ is requiring them to participate in a traffic signal. So, that, so there are development through the subdivision regulations. You can require some of those um, infrastructure improvements that they have to do those improvements that make those roads safer, um, that provide for that long-term growth. And just because it's for 2045 doesn't mean it will always stay there. No. You know, no. The, if development occurs quicker, then <laughs> it may, it'll go up on the priority level. So I think you're hearing from the commission, if, correct me if I'm wrong, that this is something that we really think is a positive thing to do and to move forward to bring things back to us that we can discuss. Okay. Does anybody Absolutely. have anything they want to add other than what Jennifer and Matt have discussed? I think we'll get down the road and we'll be talking about a lot of different things, but to get things off the ground, I think what you guys have talked about would be a great start. I have one more thing. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I want to go back to um, scenic corridors is that going to be a discussion down the road uh you talked about signage and i know one way to uh to kind of help that grow right is is to establish maybe of scenic corridors i don't know matt do you have any ideas on that um there, there are scenic city uh um, allowances i mean you know if, if that's something that the commission would like us to explore i think that's a, a great option and uh, there's a lot of resources out there for establishing a scenic city and scenic corridors, uh, we could align those types of uh, perimeters with our, our study, uh, Commissioner. 
And that would be regulated through the sign code. Sign code. So mm -hmm. we, we do have that authority to impose sign codes along those corridors, so we could look at that um, as part of this overall rewrite of how we're going to address that. Great. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you all. Um, let me try to find my agenda. Any updates on uh, item five, update. Update on recent city council actions regarding planning department items. Well, we took the, I think that's happened probably since we've last met, but we did take the Bastrop Grove uh, amendment forward. So that's mm -hmm. the, I think the last thing the council's approved that has come from PNZ. So okay. not, not a lot of, it is national planning month for the month of October. Yay. So celebrate your planners. No. <laughs> <laughs> And the Planning Commission. Uh, thank you. Y'all have done a um, Herculean job over the last three years, um, especially in light of fluctuating staff and directors and the like. You all have done a great job. Thank you. Item 5B, individual requests from P Planning and Zoning Commissioners about particular items to be listed on future agendas. I think we've given you a task. <laughs> Um, keeping in mind that I still want to, at one point, get back to reviewing the, the uh, comprehensive plan. Comprehensive yes. plan. And, that's, and that's been a part of the discussion of your comprehensive plan is also what feeds into your extraterritorial jurisdiction uh, plan. So that is definitely something we want to circle back to. I'll just be like a broken record. You yeah. hear that from me all the time. <laughs> okay. Is there anything? Pablo, where'd you go? Yes, yeah, so we can get an update on the uh, planning director. So right now we're focusing on hiring some of our other positions. Uh, we actually have been interviewing for a planning tech uh, because we do plan on reopening the building here in the next couple of weeks. Um, so, and we, one another thing that we've just implemented in the last six weeks, eight weeks, is the MyGov, which is our new online tracking system. Um, so we're trying to fill some of those other positions to help with those, the, the, the log of, getting that up and running, getting our older information um, reflected in the system, and um, handling, there's been a lot of uh, uptick in development recently. Yeah. Viviana has been very busy issuing trade permits constantly. So getting, getting some additional administrative staff on board has been the, the primary focus right now. So in that, but that's coming to fruition. So you'll, we'll, we, we may have more updates on planning director in the future, so. Great. Once again, kudos to all of you. Proud of you. Which brings us to item six, adjournment. Which we now learn needs a motion and a second, if you attended the training the other day. So. Is there a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Motion, is there a second? A second. A second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? We're adjourned. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Everyone have a great evening.